Good morning, Netroots. Okay, I'm Sue Marsh. <clears throat> I'm here to speak to you about um, an example of a campaign that, that achieved some success. Um, I hope most of you have heard of it, um, the Spartacus campaign. But I want to go back two years. Two years ago, sick and disabled people had nothing, absolutely nothing. They had no politicians on their side. There was a political consensus between Labour, the Conservatives, and the Liberal Democrats that said, actually, they're all just scroungers, and if we give them a big enough kick up the bottom, they can find some work. Um, and that was based on, actually, no evidence and no understanding of sickness and disability. We had no media. We had no newspapers. We had nobody on television. No journalists were interested in covering the stories of sick and disabled people, especially when it came down to welfare. Um, in fact, as you probably know, I tried to put a lot of media together for, for some of our campaigns, and I heard over and over and over again, but it's welfare, it's not a story. We can't report welfare, which was very disappointing. Um, charities, I think probably by the time we started to all wake up, they were starting to wake up too, but they found that their hands were tied. They had government contracts that they didn't want to lose, um, mainly because it would hurt us. Um, they also had funding issues that, that they couldn't necessarily just say what they wanted to say. Um, and the public. If I speak to a taxi driver, which I do every time I come to London, and I say to him what I do, I'm a sickness and disability campaigner trying to fight the government's cuts on sickness benefits, they will always say, and I imagine you can say it in unison with me, oh, but yeah, there's loads of people just trying it on. You know there are, we've got to find these cheats. So this is what we faced. Um, and social media was really the only outlet left to us. Um, what's really important to say, I think, and I hope there are other Spartaki in the room, I'll go on to that later. What's really important to say is that we came together as friends first. We came together to support each other. We came together um, to talk about our stories and say, well, hang on, there's no way I could work. Or, hang on, there's no way my poor mum could, could you know, get over what, what she suffers with to, to work. And it was that care and it was listening to each other and finding that actually we were all telling the same stories that I think brought people together in a way that other campaigners hadn't managed to do at that point. So we had this unique relationship with social media. We couldn't necessarily take to the streets and march up and down past Westminster. We couldn't necessarily get to radio stations or television studios and be interviewed. Um, social media allowed us to form communities and I think before you think about campaigning, you need to think about the community you're going to build. What, what do you need to do for that community? What do they need from you? And it was a relief. You could feel a sense, I think, of, of palpable relief. Every time a new blog started and someone started writing about the same sorts of things, they suddenly realised there was a whole network of people out there suffering in exactly the same way that they were. And don't underestimate the terror, and I, I'm not using hyperbole, the terror that people felt at this time. Because they felt that there was a government, particularly once the Conservatives came in, but even before that, who didn't want to listen to them, actually couldn't hear them and, and wouldn't hear them. But we could see that big, big changes were happening for sick and disabled people. Changes that hadn't been seen for a generation. We knew that we were going to be pushed back into institutions if these changes went ahead. We knew we were going to be left with the choice of whether to buy food or whether not to buy food if these choices went ahead. We knew we were left with the choice of whether we'd put the heating on or not if these changes went ahead. But we couldn't tell anybody. We had no way of telling anybody. And even when we did try, often people didn't want to hear it. So we had that loyalty. We had that community that we built of support before we did anything else. Then George Osborne did his comprehensive spending review, and I can tell you that I know activists who sat there with tears streaming down their faces as they listened to the raft of cuts that he added on top of the cuts that we were already terrified about. For instance, neither the Conservatives or the Liberal Democrats mentioned that they were going to just abolish disability living allowance in either of their manifestos, but they did. Uh, we didn't know what was going to replace it. We didn't know whether people would still qualify. We didn't know how many people would, would miss out. All we knew was that he announced this cut as a 20% cut of disability living allowance before anyone had been assessed, before they had any idea of the stock, excuse my walking stick, of the stock they were dealing with, as they call us. I'll put it down. That's better. Um, they had no idea. They just knew they were cutting. And that message that that sent to people like me and other people sitting at home was, 
we're in big trouble. This is more of the same. This is policy that's not based on evidence. And this is policy that's just going to harm people if you don't understand who it is you're dealing with. And frankly, these are the most vulnerable people in our society, and they are the people that these guys said they would protect. So I think organically, really, I started my blog two, less than two years ago, and I didn't even know what a blog was. I, hands up, I didn't know. I just knew it was some kind of outlet where I could write, which is something I've always done. I could write about this frustration and this fear and this... this horror and hope that other people might read it and they might feel the same way and we might be able to, to find each other. At the same time, I think lots of other blogs um, set up at the same time with, with people writing similar things. Um, the Welfare Reform Bill was really something we could all rally round. Um, it was something to fight. We had um, a certain amount of time, we had about 18 months, to fight this bill and to try and stop it from going ahead or at least mitigate the worst, um, the worst effects of it. Now, people have lobbied MPs before, clearly. I'm not entirely sure they've ever lobbied MPs quite as we did. Um, first of all, we used Twitter to tell our stories. There was actually something incredibly powerful about trying to explain your fears and your, your dread in 140 characters. It, it was amazing when you read back through these Twitter stories how poignant they could be, how powerful they were and how they reached out to other people on Twitter who said, well, what, what, what is disability living allowance? What is employment support allowance? I, I don't know what this is. Who, who are these people? Why are they so, so afraid? And every day, this brought more people into our campaign, whether they were sick or disabled themselves, whether they had sick or disabled relatives, whether they were carers, or whether they just were human beings who thought, hang on, I don't actually think this is a very good idea. Um, we told our personal stories. We asked people to write in if they could bear to. And it's worth saying here that lots of people wouldn't use their own names. By this stage, they were so terrified of leaving their homes, of adding their names to anything that opposed the government, that they were too frightened to even write in their own names. Uh, this is England in 2012. Can I just remind everybody? Um, that, was, that was a horrible thing for me, to be honest. Uh, we even did a naked photo shoot um, of, of Callia Franklin's bottom, which some of you may remember we sent out to everybody um, with her just out of reach of her wheelchair laying on the beach, um, asking not to be left out in the cold, which was, was very powerful. Uh, we worked with the Liberal Democrats at a time when, when a lot of other activists wouldn't do that. Um, they were so angry with the betrayal that they felt from the Liberal Democrats that they just couldn't bring themselves to work together. We knew we had a bill to fight, and actually our cause was more important than whether we were Liberal Democrat, whether we were Labour, or indeed whether we were Conservative. Anyone can become sick or disabled in a heartbeat. Anyone can have an accident skiing down a mountain. Anyone can wake up and find that headache's actually a brain tumour. Uh, we, we came together across parties, and we actually managed to change Liberal Democrat policy. Now, that was an exciting day. We'd been working for three, four months behind the scenes to try and get an amendment um, a motion put through at Liberal Democrat conference. I could tell you all the stops and starts that it had. We nearly got pulled so many times, but we did manage to get a motion through. We did get it passed, and it became Liberal Democrat policy. Um, we knew then that we could change things, and we could change things by, by working together. Um, I even sang a welfare song. When the bill went to the Lords, I recorded a version of Janis Joplin's um, won't you buy me a Mercedes-Benz, but it was, um, my lords, won't you help me with welfare reform? Um, we tried everything. We tried everything, and social media let us do that. Uh, Twitter, Facebook groups, you know, we, we, just, we just tried absolutely everything we could to be heard. And it started to work. Um, I would say we won over The Guardian by the end of 2011. Um, they decided that our evidence and our stories were more um, believable than the government's. They started to report our stories. Uh, we had the odd little bit of success on radio shows, but still far, far, far from what we needed to try and be a welfare bill that everybody wanted to go through. Uh, when we started to lobby the peers, I'm not entirely sure they'd been lobbied before. If they had, they certainly hadn't been lobbied the way we lobbied them. <laughs> I can see Emma's laughing over there. Um, we put together email groups. We, we were forensic. We were like an army by then. I would say we maybe had a 1,000 active uh, people trying to change things online. 
we did adopt a peer. We found it was much, much more successful to adopt a peer, to write to them on a personal level, to try and explain to them what it was we needed to get across, to focus on the crossbenchers who we knew would be key, than it was to send out these, these template um, emails, which at the time were, were, were really popular. Um, 38 Degrees were sending out a lot of them. UK Uncut was sending out a lot of them. We worked out after a fairly short space of time that, that they weren't, weren't really doing the job and actually you needed to win hearts and minds of, of these people who held your lives in their hands. Um, handily, we had quite an emotive issue we could talk to them about, so that helped. Um, so we, we put together email templates, we had databases. Um, I think someone mentioned earlier that uh, an MP said um, if he gets 200 emails, he's shitting himself. I would love to know what Lord Freud was doing on the morning of certain votes when they were getting 600 emails an hour from us, and, and Emma can confirm that, that they were getting that. Um, in fact, I think there's a speech recorded on Hansard where a particularly doughty Tory MP, a uh, Tory peer, stands up and says, you know, these, these emails, they're just too much. You know, I've had 600 emails in my inbox this morning, and we know there's a message to get across, but could you just, could you just calm it down, please? Um, no, we won't calm it down, and we'll try to send you 1,200 next time. Um, and then, what I'm here to talk about, I'm sure Sunny's pleased I'm getting to the Spartacus report, because time was pressing. It was November, December... Um, we had made some steps, but we needed to make more, and we needed to prove to people that we were basing our, 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 our stuff on evidence, and we needed to show that, that we were an electorate. Um, so someone presented me with a, a, the bare bones of the Spartacus report. They'd done the research, a little idea that had come up six months before. Ooh, you know, we've had this freedom of information request. We've got all the responses to the consultation on abolishing DLA. Could you just have a look through them and see if they really are as positive as the government made out that they were? And very quickly we realised they weren't positive at all. We'd been completely misrepresented. Um, the government had said that there was broad support for their changes. We were finding that there was something like 92, 93, 96% opposition to their changes. And this is every charity in the country. This is every council in the country, every disability group in the country, every campaign group. We'd been mis misrepresented. There were also other issues. We'd, we'd heard over and over again that there'd been a 30% rise in, in disability living allowance claims. It simply wasn't true. Uh, unless, of course, the Conservatives want to start cutting disability benefits from pensioners and children, which they seem to have no appetite to do. So if you're just going to take the working age people, the rise had actually been 13%. So we were misrepresented across the board. Um, I put a little blog post up and said, would other sick and disabled people like to raise some money to put this stuff into an official hard copy of a report that we can send to every MP and peer in the country. Uh, the first target was £2,000. We raised it in 24 hours. Um, and these are people who haven't got a lot of money, remember. These are people who were donating their, their £10 Christmas bonus. Um, the messages are heartbreaking. You know, here's £5 from my DLA. I hope you save it for me. So we raised the money overnight, um, and the most incredible thing started to happen. Yes, we had our, our sick and disabled people who maybe couldn't get out and about so much, but suddenly help came from everywhere. We had help from the um, Church Poverty Action Group. We had help from The Guardian. Um, I think I'm allowed to say we had help from Alistair Campbell. We had help from all over the place. Suddenly, people had something to, to, to rally around, and I think that's an important thing. Social media can do so much, but something physical, something in the, in the flesh that says, you know, we're here and we're going to put this in front of your faces, was what made the big difference. We were adamant that the report had to be produced by sick and disabled people, their friends or carers. It had to be from us. Finally, and perhaps for the first time I can think of in our society, we had to speak with our voice. We were being misrepresented through the press. We were being misrepresented by politicians. The only way we could do this was to speak for ourselves. Um, we, by that time, we had experts that had joined. My blog tends to be a bit geeky at times, so I had quite a lot of people that were interested in the nuts and bolts of the welfare reform bill, really good at statistics. Um, everybody wrote their bit. Magically, everyone came in. Over Christmas, this was, we had really tight deadlines. We produced a major report in four weeks. 
um, over Christmas. So you can just imagine what we were trying to do and the flirting and the cajoling I had to do to get people um, to write their pieces on time. Um, one of the guys was Declan Gaffney. He gave up his Boxing Day and his New Year's Day to write his part for the report. He didn't like me at the time. Um, Nonetheless, magic seemed to happen. It all came together at once, and we had our report. Printing deadlines, absolutely everything came together. We had it. Um, we had armies of people come to my flat to stuff envelopes over the weekend just before we were about to send them off. Um, it was just magic. It was just magic. It was this opportunity. And you could feel amongst this group of people who'd had no hope, they'd had no... They were cynical. They, they didn't think there was any point fighting for quite a long time. And then suddenly, over this period, you could feel sparks of hope starting to come from all over the place. You could feel people starting to think, could we really do this? Could we actually manage to change this narrative ourselves? And you could feel it. It was, it was, it was amazing. Um, so we had our report. We had the hard copies. We had them all stuffed into envelopes. Uh, we booked a courier. We got them taken up to the Houses um, of Commons and, and to the House of Lords. They wouldn't take them. They wanted 289 pounds from us to take delivery, which we couldn't do. Someone amazing from, from Left Foot Forward called Matt Zarb just rushed down to the House of Lords and took delivery and said he would put them physically into every pigeonhole for us. This was the kind of magic that seemed to happen. Um, we timed it to be released three days before, two days before um, the big votes in the Lords. So all this lobbying that we'd done behind the scenes, all these relationships we'd built up, all the evidence we'd, we'd passed on, we timed the report to come out just before in the hope that we could build enough of a buzz um, to get them thinking that maybe there were more of us than there, there really were, or in, the, in the hope that we could get them to listen. Um, the report came out, we launched it at 10 a.m. Um, we'd got 2,000 people in email groups who were all ready to go. We'd worked out that they were gonna tweet in blocks between 10 and 12, 12 and 2, 2 and 4, 4 and 6 to keep it trending all day. And the government didn't know anything about this because it had all been done secretly by email. Uh, when we launched at 10 o'clock in the morning, I think it took about half an hour before it was trending number one worldwide. Um, it was amazing. We had Stephen Fry joining in. We had comedians like Sue Perkins and Tim Minchin joining in. We had politicians giving us statements of support, and it went on all day long. Any of you that were involved will remember the buzz, I'm sure, of seeing that Spartacus Report trended um, all day long, um, number one or number two, that finally we were being heard, that finally journalists from across the spectrum were saying, hey, hey, we've missed this completely. We, we didn't want to report welfare. What, 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 what? What are you talking about? We don't know anything about this. Um, that was quite exciting. Um, apparently, by the end of the day, we had three million tweets regarding Spartacus report. Um, and if anyone wants to know where the name came from, it was a fairly frenzied panic about four days before saying, what on earth are we going to call this thing? So uh, that also was done on the hoof. Um, the really important thing was that it did create an atmosphere that we needed at that time to say to peers and MPs and anybody else listening, we're here and we really, really need you to hear us. Um, two days later, the ESA votes started to happen in the Lords, um, Employment Support Allowance. We would have been fighting the one-year time limit on this so hard. Uh, it meant that anybody sick or disabled, if they'd paid national insurance, maybe all their lives, uh, suddenly they were only going to get one year's worth of support. And I'm sorry, but I've been sick for 28 years and I just couldn't see that was going to work for me. I was fairly sure it wasn't going to work for other people. Uh, we won all of those votes in the House of Lords. And any of you who remember the media that night, um, it, was, it was very, very funny because they had no idea. We had no idea we were going to win, but we had kind of begun to get some idea. They had no idea we were going to win. And watching all the lobby journalists rushing around trying to catch peers to see what on earth happened over sickness and disability benefits was a sight to behold. We went on to win eight votes in the Lords, um, eight amendments. More importantly, people out there might be thinking, yeah, but then the government just used financial privilege to overturn them all. Yes, they did. It was very disappointing, and I won't say what I think about them for doing it, but what's really important is that the momentum built. So by the seventh vote, the eighth vote, they were so terrified of us winning that they were just giving away the China. So um, Lord Freud stood up um, just before one of the votes and was, was so frightened he was dropping his notes and stuttering. I don't, I don't know if you remember that. Um, it was great for us. We loved it. Um, and the momentum was building in other ways. I was asked to be on Newsnight. 
two, two years ago, remember, I hadn't even had a blog. I didn't know what a blog was. Suddenly I was on Newsnight opposite Chris Grayling, getting that chance, that opportunity to finally argue our case and to say, no, you're wrong, and no, you don't know what that policy is. No, you're lying, which was a wonderful thing. Um, the next morning I got to go to the House of Lords and we wrote our own amendment to the Welfare Reform Bill. We asked them to pause the abolishing of DLA completely until they'd done a proper test, until they'd done proper pilots and seen that it was going to work for people. And if you think it was exciting to see Spartacus report trending, you should have been there the day we were all waiting for our own amendment to go through and the votes and everything else. It was, it was just so exciting. We didn't win, but we only lost by nine votes. 16 votes, sorry. We lost by 16 votes. We had 24 hours to get that amendment won. So the fact that we lost by, by 16 votes um, absolutely terrified Lord Freud. And I know he had a lot more emails than 600 that day. Um, so that's, that's where we got to. Now, um, certainly people know who we are. Um, certainly know, people know what we're trying to do. Um, other groups have worked brilliantly with us. And I think we're at a stage now where we've got contacts at the Daily Mail, we've got contacts at the Daily Mirror, we've got contacts at the Guardian, we've got contacts at the Times, we've got contacts at Sky TV, we've got contacts at the BBC. If there's a story on welfare, they'll ask me or Kalia or one of our other campaigners to comment on that story. We've got a voice, we've got a chance to challenge, we've got a chance to put our, our point across, and that's something we didn't have before.